Hey guys and Disney fans alike and welcome to another movie talk. Yes, it's time for the second round of Disney films. And I have another... I think it's six or seven of them to look through. And we're going to go chronologically with these. So first up is Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So here we go, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I'll say it's a 1937 American animated musical fantasy film produced by Walt Disney Productions and released by RKO Radio Pictures. Based on the German fairy tale by the Brothers Grimm, it is the first full length cell animated feature film and the earliest in the Walt Disney Animated Classic series. The story was adapted by storyboard artist Dorothy Ann Blank, Richard Creedon, Meryl DeMary, Otto Englander, Earl Hurd, Dick Rickard, Ted Sears, and Webb Smith, David Hand, was the supervising director, while William Cottrell, Wilfred Jackson, Larry Morrie, Pierce, P Pierce Pierce, sorry, Purse Pierce, and Ben Sharpstein directed the film's individual sequences. Snow White premiered at the car at, at the Cafe Circle Theatre. On December 21st, 1937, followed by a nationwide release on February 4th, 1938. And with international earnings of $8 million during its initial release, briefly assumed the record highest grossing sound film of the time. The popularity of the film has led to it being re-released theatrically many times until its home video release in the 1990s. Adjusted for inflation, it is one of the top 10 uh, performers at the North American box office. At the 11th Academy Awards, Walt Disney was awarded an honorary Oscar and the film was nominated for Best Musical Score the year before in 1989 in the United States Library of Congress, deemed the film culturally, historically or aesthetically significant and selected it for preservation in the National Film Registry and is ranked in the American film. Okay. Now, uh, the plot. Snow White is a lonely princess living with her stepmother, a vain and wicked queen. The queen fears that Snow White's beauty surpasses her own, so she forces Snow White to work as, scholar, as a scullery maid and asks her magic mirror daily, who is the fairest of all? For several years, the mirror always answered that the queen was pleasing, uh, was pleasing her. One day, the magic mirror informs the queen that Snow White is now the fairest in the land. The jealous queen orders her huntsman to take Snow White into the forest and kill her. She further demands that the huntsman return with Snow White's heart in a jeweled box as proud of the deed, as proof of the deed. However, the huntsman cannot bring himself to kill Snow White. He tearfully begs for her forgiveness, revealing the queen wants her dead, and urges her to flee into the woods and never look back. Lost and frightened, the princess is befriended by woodland creatures who lead her to a cottage deep in the woods, finding seven small chairs in the cottage's dining room. Snow White assumes the cottage 
is the untidy home of seven orphan children. In reality, the cottage belongs to seven adult dwarfs named Doc, Grumpy, Happy, Sleepy, Bashful, Sneezy and Dopey who work in a nearby mine. Returning home, they are alarmed to find their cottage clean and suspect that an intruder has invaded their home. The dwarf finds no White upstairs asleep across three of their beds. Snow White awakes to find the dwarfs at her bedside and introduces herself and all of the dwarfs eventually welcome her into their home after they learn she can cook and clean beautifully. Snow White keeps the house for the dwarfs while they mine for jewels during the day and at night they all sing, play music and dance. Meanwhile, the Queen discovers that Snow White is still alive. When the mirror again answers that Snow White is the fairest in the land and reveals that the heart is in the jewel box. In the jewel box is actually that of a pig. Using magic to disguise herself as an old hag, the Queen creates a poisoned apple that will put whoever eats it into the sleeping death, a curse that can only be broken by love's first kiss, but dismisses that Snow White will be buried alive. The queen goes to the cottage while the dwarfs are away, but the animals are wary of her and rush off to find the dwarfs. The Queen tricks Snow White into biting into the poisoned apple. As Snow White falls asleep, the Queen proclaims that she is now the fairest of the land. The dwarfs return with the animals. As the Queen leaves the cottage and gives chase, tripping her on a cliff, she tries to roll a boulder over them. But before she can do so, lightning strikes the cliff, causing her to fall to her death. The dwarfs return to their cottage to, and find Snow White seemingly dead, being kept in a death-like slumber by the potion. Unwilling to bury her out of sight in the ground, they instead place her in a glass coffin trimmed with gold in a clearing in the forest, together with the woodland creatures. They watch over her. A year later, a prince who had previously met and fallen in love with Snow White learns of her eternal sleep and visits her coffin. Saddened by her apparent death, he kisses her, which breaks the spell and awakens her. The dwarfs and animals all rejoice as the prince takes Snow White to his castle. Okay now, guys, guys, guys. Whoops. Snow White being Walt Disney's first feature length animated film. Pretty cutting edge for them to do something like that, especially in the late 1930s. Well, I think it was a perfect beginning to their feature filmmaking careers and 10 out of 10. The next film we're going to look at tonight is Dumbo.
Now here we go. Dumbo is an American animated film produced by Walt Disney Productions and presented so, and premiered on October 23rd, 1941 by RKO Radio Pictures. Okay, we're not going to read all of that information. Let's just get into the plot. Okay, here we go. A flock of storks deliver babies while circus animals are being transported by train from their winter quarters. Mrs. Jumbo, one of the elephants, receives her baby, who is soon tormented by the other female elephants because of his large ears, and they nickname him Dumbo. Once the circus is assembled, Mrs. Jumbo loses her temper at a group of boys for tormenting Dumbo, and is locked up and deemed mad. Dumbo is shunned by the other elephants, with no mother to care for him, and is now alone. Timothy Q. Mouse, who feels sympathy for Dumbo, and becomes determined to make him happy again, appoints himself as Dumbo's mentor and protector. The circus director makes Dumbo the top of an elephant pyramid stun, but Dumbo trips over and his ears trips over his ears and misses his target, injuring the other elephants and bringing down the big top. Dumbo is made a clown as a result and plays the main role in an act that involves him falling into a vat of pie filling. Despite his newfound popularity and fame, Dumbo dislikes this job and is now more miserable than ever. To cheer Dumbo up, Timothy takes him to visit his mother. On the way back, Dumbo cries and then starts to hiccup. So Timothy takes him for a drink of water from a bucket, which, unknown to them, has accidentally had a bottle of champagne knocked into it. As a result, Dumbo and Timothy both become drunk and see hallucinations of pink elephants. The next morning, Dumbo and Timothy wake up in the tree. Timothy wonders how they, get, how they got up in the tree and concludes that Dumbo flew up there using his large ears as wings. With the help from a group of crows, Timothy is able to get Dumbo to fly again using a psychological trick of a magic feather to boost his confidence. Back at the circus, Dumbo performs a stunt which involves jumping through a high building, this time from a much higher platform. On the way down, Dumbo loses the feather. Timothy quickly tells him that the feather was never magical and that he is still able to fly. Dumbo is able to pull out of the dive and flies around the circus, finally striking back his tormentors. As a stunned audience looks on in amazement, after this performance, Dumbo becomes a media sensation. Timothy becomes his manager, and Dumbo and Mrs. Jumbo are given a private car on the circus train. Oh, there you go. You overcome adversity in the form of that. Perfect, isn't it, for... I think it was Disney's fourth classic, actually. So, um, here we go. Okay, guys. The next film, I believe, on the list for review today, or in this particular episode, is...
Alice in Wonderland. So here we go, Alice in Wonderland. It's a 1951 American animated musical fantasy film produced by Walt Disney Productions and based on the Alice books by Lewis Carroll, the 13th of Disney's animated features. The film premiered in New York City and London on July 26, 1951. The film features the voices of Catherine Beaumont, who also voiced Wendy Darling in the 1953 Disney film Peter Pan, as Alice, and Ed Wynn as the Mad Hatter. Okay. Now, pretty, pretty much a self-explanatory plot here. But, uh, just a refresher. On a golden spring day at the riverbank, Alice grows bored listening to her sister read aloud from a history book. When her sister prevents Alice from daydreaming, Alice tells her kitten Dinah that she would rather live in a nonsensical magic land called Wonderland. While daydreaming, Alice spots a waistcoat-wearing white rabbit passing by, exclaiming that he is late for an important date. Alice gives chase and follows him into a large furnished rabbit hole. Alice's dress catches her fall like a parachute as she floats gently down. Seeing the white rabbit disappear into a tiny door, Alice tries to follow him but is too big for the door, whose talking knob advises her to alter her size, using a mysterious bottle marked Drink Me. The contents cause her to shrink rapidly. Unfortunately, the door is locked and the key is out of reach. Alice then treats herself to a cookie that says Eat Me and expands large enough to fill the entire room. She weeps large tears which flood the room like an ocean. Another drink from the bottle causes Alice to shrink again. The doorknob is forced to let her through or drown. In Alice's tears, Alice floats through the door's keyhole and into Wonderland. She meets numerous strange characters. The Dodo followed by Tweedledee and Tweedledum, who recount the tale of the walrus and the carpenter. Alice eventually tracks the white rabbit to his house. She is sent to retrieve some gloves after being mistaken for his housemaid. She eats a cookie and grows into a giant again. Getting stuck in the rabbit's house, the white rabbit, the dodo and the chimney sweep, Bill the lizard, think Alice is a monster. They plot to burn the house down but Alice escapes by eating a carrot and shrinking to the size of an insect. She meets a garden of talking flowers who initially welcome her with a song, but then suddenly mistake Alice for a weed and chase her off. Alice is instructed by Caterpillar to eat a piece of his mushroom so that she can return to her original size. Alice keeps the remaining pieces of the mushroom on hand. Alice meets the Cheshire Cat. He recommends that she visit the Mad Hatter, March Hare and Dormouse. 
the three are hosting a mad tea party to celebrate Alice's unbirthday. The white rabbit appears, but the mad hatter and the march hare destroy the pocket watch. His pocket watch. They eject the white rabbit from the party. Fed up with the nonsense surrounding her, Alice abandons her pursuit of the white rabbit in order to go home. She gets lost in the togi, in the togi wood. Fearing she is lost forever, Alice breaks down into tears. The Cheshire cat reappears and leads Alice into a giant hedge maze ruled by the tyrannical Queen of Hearts and her meek husband, the King of Hearts. The Queen orders the beheading of anyone who enrages her, particularly a trio of gardeners who accidentally planted white roses instead of red ones. Alice is invited Reed forced to play the Queen in a bizarre croquet match. Both contestants use flamingos and hedgehogs as the equipment. The Cheshire Cat appears again and pulls a trick on the Queen for which she blames Alice. The girl is arrested and put on trial unfairly judged and convicted. Suddenly Alice remembers that she still has the remains of the caterpillar's mushroom and consumes both halves, immediately becoming a giantess. Alice makes it very clear what she really thinks of the queen. However, she returns to her normal size just as rapidly. Enraged, the queen orders her execution. Alice flees and is pursued by most of Wonderland's characters until she finally reunites with the doorknob. Alice begs the talking doorknob to let her through. He informs her that she is having a dream. Alice wakes herself up in the just in time, now realising that logic and reason exist for a purpose. Alice walks home with her sister and Dinah for tea. Alice in Wonderland 1951. What do I think of it? Da 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 da! Um, no surprise there. <laughs> okay. Now, guys, it's time to take a look at our. Is it our penultimate film? Um, no, it's not. Our next film. For tonight, or for this episode, Lady and the Tramp. So, Lady and the Tramp is a 1955 American animated romantic musical comedy film produced by Walt Disney and released to theatres on the 22nd of June 1955 by Buena Vista Distribution. The 15th film in the Walt Disney animated classic series, it was the first animated feature filmed in the Cinemascope widescreen film process. Based on Happy Dan. The Whistling Dog by Ward Green, Lady and the Tramp. Okay. Instead of, um... Yep, here we go. Let's have the plot. On Christmas morning, 1909, in a quaint Midwestern town, Jim Deere gives his wife Darling an American Cocker Spaniel puppy, which he names Lady. Lady enjoys a happy life with the couple and two local neighbourhood dogs, Jock, a Scottish Terrier, and Trusty, a Bloodhound. Meanwhile, across town, a stray mutt named Tramp lives on his own 
dining on scraps from Tony's restaurant and protecting his friends from the local dog catcher. One day, Lady is saddened after her owners begin treating her rather coldly. Jock and Trusty visit her and determine that their change in behaviour is due to Darling expecting a baby. While Jock and Trusty try to explain what a baby is, Tramp interrupts the conversation and offers his own thoughts on the matter, making Jock and Trusty take an immediate dislike to the stray and order him out of the yard. As Tramp leaves, he reminds Lady that when the baby moves in, the dog moves out. Eventually, the baby arrives and the couple introduces Lady to the infant, whom Lady grows fond of. Soon after, Jim, Deer and Darling leave for a trip, with their Aunt Sarah looking after the baby and the house. Aunt Sarah's two troublemaking Siamese cats, Si and Am, trick her into thinking that Lady attacked them with the house a mess. Aunt Sarah takes Lady to a pet shop to get a muzzle. Lady flees in horror, only to be pursued by a pack of stray dogs. Trump rescues her and finds a beaver at the local zoo who can remove the muzzle. Later, Tramp shows Lady how he lives, footloose and collar free, eventually leading into a candlelit Italian dinner at Tony's. Lady begins to fall in love with Tramp, but she chooses to return home in order to watch over the baby. Tramp offers to escort Lady back home, but when Tramp decides to chase hens around a farmyard for fun, Lady is captured by the dog catcher and brought to the local dog pound. While at the dog pound, the other dogs reveal to Lady that Tramps had multiple girlfriends in the past and they feel it's unlikely he'll ever settle down. She is eventually claimed by Aunt Sarah who chains her in the backyard as a punishment for running away. Jock and Trusty visit the, conf the comfort lady, but when Tramp arrives to apologise, Lady angrily confronts him about his past girlfriends. Just as Tramp leaves, Lady sees a rat trying to sneak into the house. She barks frantically, but Aunt Sarah tells her to be quiet. Tramp hears her barking and rushes back, entering the house and corners the rat in the nursery. Lady breaks free and rushes to the nursery, where Tramp inadvertently knocks over the baby's crib before ultimately killing the rat. The commotion alerts Aunt Sarah, who sees both dogs and assumes that they are responsible. She pushes Tramp in a closet and locks Lady in the basement, and then calls the pound to get rid of Tramp. Jim, Deer and Darling return home as the dog catcher departs. And when they release Lady, she leads them to the dead rat. Realising Tramp's true intentions, Jock and Trusty chase after the dog catcher's wagon. The dogs are able to track down the wagon and scare the horses, causing the wagon to crash. Jim Deere arrives in a taxi with Lady and she reunites with Tramp. But their joy is short-lived when they see Trusty pinned underneath the wagon motionless with Jock howling mournfully. That Christmas, Tramp's been adopted into the family and he and Lady have started a family of their own with three daughters who look similar to Lady and a son who looks similar to Tramp. Jock comes to see the family along with Trusty, who's still alive and merely suffered 
from a broken leg which is still healing. Thanks to the puppies, Trusty has a fresh audience for his old stories. But he has forgotten them. The Lady and the Tramp, 1955. Guys, what do I think of it? Da -da -da -dum. We're now into the penultimate film of this episode. Robin Hood. Robin Hood is a 1973 American-British animated film produced by Walt Disney Productions, which was first released in the United States on November 8, 1973, the 21st animated feature in the Walt Disney Animated Classic series. The film is based on the legend of Robin Hood, but uses anthropomorphic animals rather than people. Yes, uh... We know the basic plot, here we go. Alan Adele introduces the story of Robin Hood and Little John, two outlaws living in Sherwood Forest, when, where they rob from the rich and give to the poor townsfolk of Nottingham, despite the efforts of the Sheriff of Nottingham to stop them. Meanwhile, Prince John and his assistant, Sir Hiss, arrive in Nottingham on a tour of the kingdom. Knowing the royal coach is laden with riches, Robin and Little John rob Prince John by disguising themselves as fortune tellers. The embarrassed Prince John then puts a bounty on their heads and makes a sheriff his personal tax collector, who takes pleasure in collecting funds from the townsfolk, including hidden money, from the crippled blacksmith, Otto and a single farthing from a young rabbit, Skippy, who had just received it as a birthday present. However, Robin Hood, disguised as a beggar, sneaks in and gives back some money to the family as well as his hat and bow to Skippy in honour of his birthday. Skippy and his friends test out a bow, but Skippy fires an arrow into the grounds of Maid Marian's castle. The children sneak inside meeting Maid Marian and her attendant Lady Cluck. Maid Marian reveals she is... She and Robin were childhood sweethearts, but they have not seen one another for years. Meanwhile, Friar Tuck visits Robin and Little John, explaining that Prince John is hosting an archery tournament, and the winner will receive a kiss from May Marion. Robin decides to participate in the tournament, disguised as a stork, whilst Little John disguises himself as the Duke of Chutney to get near Prince John. Sir Hiss discovers Robin's identity, but is trapped in a barrel of ale by Friar Tuck. And Alan Adele... Robin wins the tournament, but Prince John exposes him and has him arrested for execution despite May Marion's pleas. Little John threatens Prince John in order to release Robin, which leads to a fight between Prince John's soldiers and the townsfolk, all of which escape to Sherwood Forest. Now, of course, we actually know how it ends, so there's no need to read any further. What do I think 
of Robin Hood 1973. Um, and finally, guys, I think a film that needs no introduction The Lion King. As we know, The Lion King is a 1994 American animated epic musical film produced by Walt Disney Feature Animations and released by Walt Disney Pictures. It is the 32nd feature in the Walt Disney Animated Classic series. And as we know, it takes place among a kingdom of lions in Africa. But here's a little bit of the plot for you guys. In a pride lands, in the pride lands of Africa, a lion rules over the animals as the king. As king, the birth of King Mufasa and Queen Sarah's son Simba creates envy and resentment in Mufasa's younger brother Scar, who knows his nephew will replace him as heir to the throne. After Simba has grown into a young cub. Mufasa gives him a tour of the Pride Lands, teaching him the responsibilities of being a king and the circle of life. Later that day, Scar tricks Simba and his best friend Nayla into exploring a forbidden elephant graveyard. Despite the protests of Mufasa's Horn Hill, Majordomo, Zazu, at the graveyard, three spotted hyenas named Shenzi, Bonsai and Ed attack the cubs before Mufasa, alerted by Zazu, rescues them and forgives Simba for his actions. That night, the hyenas are killed, uh, uh, sorry, are allied with Scar plot with him to kill Mufasa and Simba. The next day, Scar lures Simba to a gorge and tells him to wait there while he gets Mufasa. On Scar's orders, the hyenas stampede a large herd of wild beast, sorry, wildebeest, into, a, into the gorge. Mufasa rescues Simba but as Mufasa tries to climb up the gorge's walls, Scar throws him back into the stampede and he is trampled to death. After Simba finds Mufasa's body, Scar convinces him he was responsible for his father's death and advises Simba to flee the kingdom. As Simba leaves, Scar orders Shenzi and Bonsai and Ed to kill the cub, but Simba escapes. The night nice Scar announces to the pride that both Mufasa and Simba were killed in the stampede and steps forward as the new king, allowing a pack of hyenas to live in the pride lands. Uh, yes, um, we know it doesn't end well. Well, of course, uh, we know Simba actually is still alive. But as we read on, well, we don't actually need to, but guys, what do I think of The Lion King? Well, unlike the rest of the films on this list, it it's not perfect. I give it an 8 at best. As usual. I'll encourage you to watch all these films for yourselves and let me know what you think in the comments. And until next time, have a good time watching movies.